All right, hello everybody. Uh, thanks for joining the MIT Mobility Forum. Uh, I'm Jinghua Zhao, the professor of cities and the transportation at MIT. And today we're really glad to have Professor Alex Jacquelet join us presenting his research on demand responsive microtransit design and operation. Uh, in fact, uh, this is the third time uh, Alex joined us this, uh, in this forum. Uh, the first time he talked about urban area mobility. The second time he talked about ride sharing. At this time, we invite him to talk about microtransit. Right? Uh, as everyone know that uh, uh, between public transit and ride sharing, each has its own pro and cons, right? Public transit has this high throughput, high density service, and ride sharing provided the more flexible, more door-to-door, -door, more uh, on-demand services, right? So here the idea is, can we bring them together, right? So uh, uh, Alex will bring today uh, his research on how to combine the two in, in an efficient way, uh, achieve both objective, and under what conditions it may perform better. And also, what challenges does it pose uh, on the organization methodology? So before I invite uh, Alex, I do want to do some warm-up exercise. Uh, first of all, uh, I do invite people to type in the chat uh, your organization, your city, and local time. All right. So I will say MIT, Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, Domino. Mm. Nice. Thanks for everyone for typing in. Hopefully, I give a context for Alex about the, the audience mixture here. Yeah. But secondly, I do want to do a short uh, poll, which I just launched, about uh, your in engagement with microtransit, right? Uh, here, uh, one is so you conduct research on this topic. Secondly, you practice it either from the industry providing service or from the government setting up the regulation. Uh, the third one is that you are user of microtransit. And fourth one, just curious about it. Uh, all right, we have more than 150 people participated. I'll give uh, three more seconds. Okay, I will share the result. All right. Uh, Alex, can you see the results? Here. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So 27 on research, 22 practice, 13 uh, use, and 40 about cures. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, great. Yeah, so uh, uh, given uh, Alex being here, this is the third time, I'll just give a very short introduction this time. So Alex Jacquelet is Associate Professor of Operation Research and Studies at MIT Sloan School of Management. His yeah. research focuses on the data-driven decision-making, spanning stochastic organization, integer organization, and machine learning. In particular, his research aims to develop scalable algorithm to support more efficient, equitable, and sustainable operations. And the domain interest includes uh, the air traffic management, on-demand microtransit, and a collaborative uh, logistic. Without further ado, let me give the forum to Alex. Chris. Thank you um, so much, uh, Jindua, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to assume that you can see my slides and hear me. If not, uh, yes. let me know. Good. Um, so yes, um, this topic is really about the uh, a bro uh, starting a discussion about demand responsive microtransit, uh, what it can look like, what it should look like, and um, from also a research standpoint, how to optimize it. And here there are, I think, two questions. One is an operational question, which is a tactical question, kind of a um, at the at the in a real time operating questions. And then there is a more strategic planning questions around the design of these networks. Um, and so in this uh, in this talk, I'm going to present some uh, two-stage stochastic optimization models and algorithms for achieving these goals. And um, so I'm going to be relatively brief on uh, the methodology, and then I will spend perhaps a little bit more time on the results to see a little bit how microtransit can contribute to the current mobility ecosystem um, of, between uh, transit and ride sharing. So just as a uh, motivation, uh, Jinwa did uh, did a much better work than uh, a much better job than I could do here. But um, 
basically the motivation for this line of work that we're leading in the in the, in my research group is uh, trying to understand how we can um, how can we can contribute to the current mobility ecosystem at the interface between public transit and ride sharing. So on the one hand, we have a transit system that is very uh, inflexible that relies on um, system, uh, on uh, you know networks that, and frequency and timetables that have that are designed at the at the planning stage. Um, and that also relies on fixed infrastructure that is very hard on time or difficult or or uh, expensive to um, to, uh, to to modify. But on the other hand, we have a ride sharing system that is indeed on demand, flexible, convenient, but at the same time still relies on single occupancy vehicles for the most part, contributing to congestion and, and emissions and also uh, leading to um, high prices for daily utilization. So. There's been the emergence of a wide range of services that are a little bit in between. Um, they are defined as such by the US Department of Transportation, a shared transportation system that can offer fixed routes and schedules as well as, as, well as flexible routes or, and on-demand scheduling. There are multiple embodiments of that middle ground. Uh, it's not really the topic of the talk to think about exactly what is how to design this, these middle grounds. There are, there's ongoing research and we have follow-on papers and follow-on research uh, at the moment on this topic. But today we're going to look precisely at one embodiment of, these, um, of this microtransit system and how to, uh, how to design and operate it. So I just want to do one, uh, to, to uh, spend one slide on more of a theoretical motivation for this. So most of you must be familiar with the traveling salesman problem. The traveling salesman problem asks for like a tour in a, num a fixed number of N cities of minimal length. Okay. And there's a very famous theorem from the 1950s that says that um, as the number of customers grows to infinity, the length of the tour grows with the square root of N, the square root of the number of customers. Uh, recently in a, in a paper, what we have done is that we have looked at a a, a cousin problem, uh, a sister problem to the TSP, which is called the traveling repairman problem, where now I don't care anymore about the length of the tour, I care, I care about the total wait times, right? So if I visit John and Genoa and Rob in that order, then John will have a lower wait time than Genoa, lower than Rob and so on and so forth. And so the question is like, what is the, the tour that minimizes that total wait time? Okay, um, and uh, what we have uh, shown in this uh, in this paper is that uh, the we have extended the, the, the this result on the left uh, to show that it uh, the total wait time will grow in n square root of n, and that kind of makes sense. We have a square root of of, of a, a, a tour of length for square root of n that will be borne by n passengers or n customers. So why am I talking about this? I'm talking about this because conceptually there is a huge difference between square root of n and n square root of n in that one function is concave and the other one is convex. So it's a very simple observation. But what this is telling me now is that um, when we when we move from a world of logistics where we have packages and we just need to deliver them to a world of transportation where we have passengers that actually care about wait times or times in, in the vehicle, then we observe this uh, negative externalities. In other words, if my microtransit system um, will need to like pick up n customers and I need to like wait for everyone to be picked up or everyone to be dropped off before I can go to my destination, then I'm going to suffer a loss of uh, service level as a result. Right? So that's kind of, the, um, that's kind of the, the motivation, the theoretical motivation for how we're conceptualizing microtransit today. So then the, what this is telling me, in a sense, is that the easy answer to, how to, to this original question here, which is let's take high capacity vehicles and just operate them on demand, doesn't necessarily work as well because of all of these negative externalities, these detours and these delays. So the question is, what can we do? So there is a first answer that we've seen a lot of in, in practice, which is small occupancy ride pooling. So here, basically, we're going to say, I'm not going to serve 100 passengers at once. I'm going to serve three, four passengers at once in order to basically reduce N in my previous slide. So there has been mixed success in practice of this uh, type of, um, of, this type of, uh, of, um, of um, services. Then there is another one, um, another possibility is to just operate in a small region. And actually, there is a lot of success of microtransit of on-demand 
high capacity vehicle operating in small regions. These are two examples uh, from, um, from Massachusetts in uh, Newton and Salem. But then what do we do in larger cities? So in larger cities, one of the prominent uh, models for microtransit is what, what I call zone-based regularization, where I'm going to say, I'm not going to operate in the entire city. I'm going to operate in a smaller area. I'm not going to operate in, uh, um, in Los Angeles. I'm going to operate in downtown LA. And uh, Los Angeles, Miami are uh, cities that actually operate under this model. Um, and actually, the most prominent mode of uh, microtransit here is uh, zone-based regularization as a feeder into existing transit system for first mile and last mile. Um, but again, here we still have the same trade-off, meaning that if my zones are too small, then I'm going to end up having small occupancy vehicles with contribution to emissions and congestion and high prices again. If my zones are too large, I'm going to have too many customers and will grow up, and then I'm going to have deteriorated level of service as a result. Right? So uh, it's uh, it's one step toward, uh, toward the solution, but it's also a motivation for us to look at something else that we call line-based regularization. So the idea here is very simple, is to say we already have a transit system that operates lines, right? We, if you go into the MTA, the MBTA website, you're going to have a set of bus lines that will all have a set of stops that will have um, scheduled times um, at each stop. And then, so the question is, can we take these lines and then have a system of on-demand routing that enables us to deviate from these lines on demand based on the real time request from the passengers. Right? So that's kind of the, uh, the, the, the system that we're considering here. Again, I'm not saying that this is like the model that, 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 that we all should follow in all municipalities, but what we're interested in here is, is there, I mean, how, can we optimize the system? Can we design that system? Can we develop scalable methodologies that enable us to support these types of operations? And also, if we're successful at that, how can we evaluate it in the current mobility systems between ride sharing and transit? So I'm going to uh, answer these questions with a real world data driven um, uh, experimental setup where we're going to consider an airport shuttle system uh, in Manhattan um, with real uh, real world demand, of course, from the New York taxi data that we are all familiar with, um, as well as um, as data from Google Maps, Uber, and uh, OpenStreetMap. So, okay, so the the I'm going to outline this uh, this paper from now on. We are developing this model that we call the microtransit network design model. Um, I, it's formulated as a two-stage stochastic integer optimization uh, model with a tight uh, second stage. I'm going to briefly uh, talk about that. We have a double decomposition um, um, algorithm that combines vendor decomposition and column generation. So for those of you who are interested, it's kind of a row and column generation algorithm, um, which uh, will scale to large scale instances with a hundred lines, hundreds of uh, stations in Manhattan, uh, thousands of uh, passenger requests. Um, and then what I want to uh, spend a few minutes on is to show how this system can actually contribute toward win-win-win outcomes in mobility, uh, equity, uh, um, efficiency, and um, environmental sustainability. Okay, so here's the problem. The problem is that I want to design in the first stage a set of lines. Each of them has a series of checkpoints with corresponding types. And then in real time, I'm going to have requests from passengers. People will actually like think about Uber, an Uber app or something will say, hey, I want to take bus uh, 37 um, at uh, 8.05 and I live, in, I, I live in this place and I'm planning to go to that station. And then once I get all of this information, all of these requests, what can I do? And in a sense, I can, on the left here, just follow the reference line back into regular public transit or I can actually have more significant deviations in order to provide a better level of service to all of these passengers. And these passengers will receive a confirmation saying, okay, actually we're not, don't, don't, go to the, don't go to the line, we're gonna come and pick you up at home, it's gonna be better for you, right? Okay, so uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes on the technical aspects of this paper. Um, this is a, actually a very difficult problem because the second stage is a vehicle routing problem. And vehicle routing problem is a very discrete, challenging discrete optimization problem 
Um, so now I have an integer optimization problem in the first stage and in the second stage, which is very hard to handle from a stochastic programming standpoint. And so what we are doing is that we are working in a load expanded network in order to have a tight second stage representation that we're just um, formulating as a network flow model in, an, in, in this expanded network. So in this network, every node represents a checkpoint and a load pair. Um, and so, for example, in this case, the blue um, the blue path goes from one checkpoint to another and uh, picks up two passengers. And so we're moving from node A to node C, comma two, where the two represents the load at checkpoint C. And so these um, variables provide an extended formulation with more variables than a corresponding segment-based uh, benchmark, um, but uh, enable us to have a much tighter relaxation that um, uh, that enabled me to then um, relax the integrality of my second stage variables. So the first stage uh, decisions will uh, tell me which line I design and how and which passengers is um, is uh, served by which line. Um, and then my second stage, um, my second stage decisions will then characterize the on-demand deviations of my uh, of my um, vehicles in this um, uh, using this uh, load expanded network representation. So I'm going to be be very brief on the on the on the formulation, but what I want to um, to pay attention to here is the objective function. We obviously have um, some construct some uh, cost associated with each line in the budget constraint. So this is very typ uh, very uh, typical in um, in a transit planning optimization. And then the second term of the object of the objective function maximizes level of service. And level of service maximizes coverage. I want to serve as many people as possible. And then I want to minimize wait, waiting time, walking time, travel time, and delay. I'm going to skip this, but uh, basically this representation here enables, um, I mean, it's basically the, the smallest possible representation that, that has that type of structure that I was, uh, I was mentioning before. Um, so how to solve how to solve this problem? So what we have is a two-stage decomposition method where we have uh, a Bender's decomposition um, across scenarios and across reference lines. Um, and then in the second uh, in the sub problem for the Bender's decomposition, what we still have an exponential number of subpath variables that I was uh, talking about before. All of these uh, all of these. Uh, all of these subpaths from checkpoint to checkpoint that grows exponentially with the number of stations between checkpoints. And so in order to circumvent that exponential growth, we're going to proceed by column generation in the sub problem, right? So we, we have a Bender's, uh, Bender's master problem, and then we have a column generation algorithm for the Bender's sub problem. And then we're iterating between these two modules. So again, I'm skipping technical details here, but um, basically uh, that, that modeling and algorithmic framework induces a double decomposition. We first have a master problem for the Bender's um, for the Bender's algorithm that essentially selects the line and the timetabling or the frequency. And then for each scenario, and in each for each reference line, the the Bender sub problem will basically find the on demand deviations based on my passenger requests. So who do I serve? Who do I serve? Where and at what time? And then I do that actually in a restricted sense because I only look at the subpath that I have in my model. And so in the column generation scheme, then I'm going to have a pricing problem that will add some of these subpaths iteratively. So if now I look at this slide from right to left, I have a problem at the bottom that adds little segments, I mean, little subpaths here and there, let's say between Kendall Square and downtown Boston, um, how to deviate from there. Then I have the middle problem that will tell me like the overall deviation, uh, overall on-demand deviations, let's say from Alewife to uh, downtown Boston, um, but kind of bring these subpaths together from beginning to end of the of the of the line. And then the problem on the left will then select the reference lines um, and their frequency. So. Um, I'm not going to go into these technical uh, results in too much detail, but the main point is that this methodology enables to scale to uh, large problems that are relevant in practice with up to 100 lines, uh, a three hour time, uh, hundreds of stations and 2000 passenger requests. 
Okay, and now I want to, um, I'm going to conclude with uh, some discussion about um, efficiency, equity, and environmental sustainability. So I, I, I'll, I'll spend a few results on these more practical results because we want to kind of understand how microtransit can contribute again to this, um, to this um, uh, urban mobility uh, ecosystem. So the first comparison is between transit and microtransit. So what we find here is that transit can actually serve more people, so increase the coverage, and at the same time, improve level of service in terms of lower wait times and lower waiting times. So in other words, by deviating from, um, from, the, uh, from the reference line, our microtransit vehicles can provide, can serve the passengers better, and at the same time, pick up more passengers. Right. So that's kind of the benefit of operating flexibility. It's basically the benefit of real time on demand operations as compared to uh, just static strategic planning. OK. OK, so now if we compare microtransit to ride sharing and for now, let's consider a capacity of one. So ride sharing without ride pooling or ride hailing, if we want. Then what we have, I mean, by design, the ride sharing provides door-to-door -door transportation. So there is no walking, there is lower wait times, but, and there is also much higher coverage. We can serve more people, but we need way more vehicles to go to the airport, right? Because uh, we are relying on single occupancy vehicles. And so that's gonna be reflected in that distance um, column here, where we're serving basically, I would say 50% more people uh, with 10X um, distance. Okay, okay, 10X number of vehicles. So vice versa, microtransit achieves demand consolidation. Okay, and I'll come back to this notion in a second. But then what, what is also interesting is to compare microtransit to ride pooling with a capacity of four, because actually these two ideas provide, um, have the same objective of using consolidation in vehicles in order to like design, a, again, a, 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 so, sort of a middle ground between uh, transit and ride sharing. And what we find here is that we achieve actually this, exactly the same demand coverage, which is quite interesting. And um, we do that at the cost of a lower delay uh, as compared to the ideal case where everyone was actually taking a taxi to the airport. And that lower delay comes from the fact that microtransit enables people to plan their trip based on the reference line, as opposed to ride pooling that is really demand responsive where people are just like, hey, I need a ride now, and then we are routing the vehicles accordingly. Right? So we're, we're saying that here, we're providing uh, an alter alternative way of consolidating, consolidating demand in multi-occupancy vehicles um, that provides uh, some benefits, also at some cost. And one of the costs is that we're asking people to walk a little bit sometimes to, um, to the pickup location. Okay, so now I want to compare uh, the networks that we have under transit in the left, on the left side, and microtransit on the right hand side. And basically, if we go back to the previous slide, what I have said is that we can achieve a higher level of service for every line. And so basically, we can do more with less. And as what this is, uh, what this is uh, showing me here, so the, the, the colors in, this map, in these maps of Manhattan show the following show the number of trips that I have to the airport during the entire three hour horizon of, on a Monday morning. And basically what we're saying is that on average, I have way more options if I live in a central location in midtown Manhattan, because there are more lines that can actually deviate to serve me, right? So that flexibility creates more options. But what I find more interesting in this plot, in this plot is that I can actually provide a higher coverage with fewer lines. So then I can use more of my budget to serve other areas. And there are 60% more locations, intersections, that are actually served under, under the microtransit network than under the transit network, which obviously comes with significant implications in terms of equity and accessibility because we're able to increase the reach of the system to underserved region. And finally, I left you before with a little bit of uh, attention. Um, I was saying that as compared to ride sharing, we were serving uh, fewer people with way fewer vehicles. Okay, great, but what happens to the other people? And what happens to the system as a whole? 
And what about transit in, the, in this mix? So here we're doing something very simple. We're trying to understand the system-wide implications of these systems. And basically, I'm, 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 I'm counting all the people that I'm serving as passengers in my system, and assuming that all the people that I'm not serving, I'm going to assume that they take a taxi to the airport or they take a ride share or whatnot. So basically, that's the, the, that's the difference between the orange distance here in this plot, which is the internal distance, and the green distance, which is the external distance, so all the people that are not served by my system. And so basically what we're saying here is that the distance of the microtransit uh, system is actually the smallest across all the modes. Why? If we compare to transit, we have higher coverage. So we are doing small deviations. We're increasing distance by a teeny bit, but we're serving way more people. We're decreasing the distance per passenger, and therefore fewer people have to rely on their own mode of transportation to go to the airport. And so as a result, we're decreasing the distance traveled by 10%. So, and this is really driven by the higher, um, higher de demand coverage and higher de uh, vehicle load. And vice versa, if we compare that to all of the right sharing and right footing options, what we end up having here is that since we're consolidating people into high capacity vehicles, we're relying on fewer single or low occupancy vehicles to go to the airport. And this comes with significant benefits in terms of um, total distance traveled. Um, so these two things combined show that there is scope for leveraging, again, the predictability and reliability associated with transit, as well as the uh, flexibility of on-demand operations in order to consolidate demand and um, mitigate the environmental footprint of, um, um, of uh, the urban, urban mobility ecosystem. So thank you. I hope, I, yeah, I'm, I'm around 20 minutes. I'm going to stop here and uh, happy Perfect. to... Uh, uh, happy to answer questions, of course. Uh, th thank you so much, Alex. You're perfect on, on time here. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I remind the audience in this forum, we encourage everyone uh, to contribute one idea, right? Uh, ask either one question or make one comment. Uh, please uh, do do so in the in the chat, right? Uh, I have uh, several questions to start. And also we have uh, Nigel and uh, Tom to, to give some remarks here. Uh, let's see. Uh, Nigel, do you, want, do you want to start? Yes, I'd be happy to uh, make a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, Alex, uh, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. It's very exciting for me to see uh, work that I began thinking of in a very heuristic way 55 years ago uh, reach uh, a really good analytical point, such as the work that you and uh, your colleagues have, have been uh, doing for the last you know, five to 10 years and presented so effectively today. So my compliments to you. I, I think a couple of observations I would have um, or sort of thoughts I would have is the, the issue of uh, pooling versus sharing. Um, I, I, I question a little bit how the demand might vary in a non-pooling versus pooling type of operation. What you've got here, it seems to me, in your microtransit uh, model is uh, the assumption that people are indifferent to pooling in a, a public transport, a, a bus type of vehicle. Um, but they may be, even though they might be quite sensitive to pooling in a, a, a car or a small van type of vehicle, and that may well be true. I'm 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 not sure, but um, I, I note that in the wake of the pandemic, I think there's a tremendous amount of sensitivity uh, on the part of the TNCs as well as perhaps on the part of the public about concerns about safety and security in a pooled environment in a small vehicle. So uh, I was out in Los Angeles for the last couple of weeks, and I took. TNCs several times or attempted to take TNCs. And I noted that none of neither Uber nor Lyft uh, offered a pooled option anymore in the wake of the pandemic. I haven't been using it much in the last few years. And I, I don't know whether that is going to be reality in the future. Um, and to what extent that aversion or perceived aversion that people may have to pooling 
pooling their their trip with with others who are unknown to them may have what effect it may have on demand and what effect it may have on um, the micro transit which effectively from my point of view potentially integrates the demand responsive aspects with the uh, traditional public transport aspect. So that's sort of a thought I have, or I'm, I'm curious about how you react to that. But anyway, my, my compliments for a very uh, effective presentation on very interesting work. Thank you so much, uh, Nigel. Very much appreciate uh, the thoughts. I got asked in the chat in uh, at the same time to uh, pull back the result size. So here it is. But uh, but uh, I'm just going to uh, reply uh, in general. I think that your point on basically the, the, the negative cost um, of pooling and uh, the impact on passenger behaviors and passenger demand is, uh, is absolutely right. Um, and in fact, I think that this is a little bit of um, um, a motivation for this research um, that, um, that we started. Uh, when, when we started, which is that a lot of the conversation in this space around um, Again, microtransit very broadly defined, um, especially when we talk about right pooling and this type of things, has been thinking about how can we take the ride sharing system as we know it in order to like increase vehicle uh, vehicle occupancy, right? And that's more or less the genesis, I think, of right pooling at the time. And as exactly you noted, there has been um, mixed success. Um, indeed, uh, the major players do not offer it nearly as much as they used to um, because of the of the of the adverse um, adverse behaviors that they they have uh, encountered and that has been also uh, decoupled I think uh, in the time of the pandemic. The, the the way we wanted to frame this conversation in a sense is can we think about it the other way? Can we actually start from a transit system that does exist today that is used today um, by many people? And can we make that system a little bit more flexible? So, right, so in that huge spectrum between these two extreme mobility options, instead of like moving the needle that way, can we move it that way? And what this results actually show us is that we can actually achieve most of the, co the demand coverage that we could with the right footing, um, with the right footing uh, idea by, Taking, taking a transit system and making it a little bit more flexible. Um, and that comes with trade-offs in terms of operating complexity, in terms of operating dynamics, in terms of like walk and wait versus delay. And that is a conversation that, um, that, that, that we can have uh, uh, as well. Um, but, uh, um, but I think that the way, I want, the way we wanted to frame the conversation is people do use transit vehicles today. Uh, there is... People do use microtransit vehicles today, and um, I saw that uh, Sal Gold is in the in the attendance, and VI is obviously the the, the major player in this uh, uh, in this um, uh, in this space. And so there there is a lot of success of like these high capacity vehicles that are actually transporting people. And the question is, how can we make that flexible as opposed to relying on fixed line ideas and um, and how to support these. Uh, these things with um, with uh, dedicated analytics and optimization methods. Um, so I think that there is a lot of work that is needed on the more uh, empirical and uh, behavioral side to really understand what are the drivers of these decisions from passengers, exactly to your point, and uh, perhaps do that hypothesis that I implicitly form around moving from right-sharing passengers to right-footing passengers, being perhaps more of an inconvenience than moving from transit to micro transit passengers. Um, so th that's opening a, a whole line of, uh, of questions. And fortunately, we have more variations today in the in this uh, mobility ecosystem that is that is creating uh, opportunities to explore these questions from a more empirical standpoint. Um, so yeah, that's uh, uh, an excellent point. I only have like a, a rough pointers as a, as a response, of course. Thanks. Uh, Tom? Uh, well, it's uh, great work as always. It's always wonderful to see your work. By the way, uh, Kayla Cummings is one of the co-authors on this paper, was a teaching assistant for me a year and a half ago. And she was extraordinary, an extraordinary teaching assistant. So I, I wonder, Alex, how many people are in each of these vehicles that you're doing? Because you talked about this being a vehicle uh, routing problem. If there's only four or five people, it's not a very difficult vehicle routing problem. And I'd also like a little bit of uh, comment about 
different types of trips. So if you're going to the airport, that may be one kind of trip. If you're going to your house, that may be another kind of trip. And so you might be more inclined to carpool in one instance and not in the other. So just a little bit of, uh, of understanding of what kind of trips you're looking at and what the size of those trips are and how that affects the analysis. Yes, that's a great question. So um, on the second one, um, what we are doing is right now, actually, let me start with the first one. The vehicle routing problem is actually relatively simple. I agree with that. Um, we have, uh, I would say, up to 20 passengers right now. Um, but the, what we're optimizing, I mean, this is only the second stage of this problem, right? So the very hard part is to embed that vehicle routing problem into a first stage optimization for network design. Um, and so that's actually what drove most of the of the modeling questions about around um, getting a getting a tight representation of routing operations, so we can actually uh, embed that into a network design problem. So, uh, so the routing part in itself is um, is indeed uh, tractable, but embedding that routing part into a network design was uh, hugely intractable when we started. Um, to your second question, and perhaps as a result of the first one, uh, what we have with the results that I have been showing right now are used for um, are used for what I would say a VRP equivalent of microtransit. And by I mean what I mean by that is that we're using um, case studies. Um, um, excuse me, we're using case studies where everyone shares the same objective, the same origin, or the same destination. So an airport shuttle, one way or the other. We are currently extending that methodology um, to have uh, also like kind of a dial or ride version of the microtransit or pickup and delivery, uh, where, for example, people would uh, drive on the Upper West Side corridor um, in or with each one with a different origin and a different destination in the north or the south um, direction. And uh, and in fact, well, we're, if anything, we're getting stronger benefits over there just because the value of flexibility is uh, is uh, stronger. Um, and then I think that there is another aspect to your last question, which I don't have a great a great answer to, and that it causes a little bit of um, uh, Nigel's question about uh, when would people be more willing to use that type of service for one type of one type of trip or another. And uh, unfortunately, I don't think that this is um, um, uh, a question that uh, you know we have the the usage data for um, in this uh, in this analysis. And I think that it warrants more empirical um, empirical um, uh, investigation, even when we have uh, some of these systems in place. Um, Great, thank you, Tom and Alex. So uh, a few questions from my side. Then I'll give to John for the audience question. The first one is: uh, if you start from the uh, kind of a classic transit point of view, fixed route to fix the uh, uh, schedule, uh, then we start to deviate, right? So now there it seems to me that there, there are two trade-offs from the consumer behavior point of view. One is uh, the people who are already on the bus versus uh, picking up another one, right? The one more person pick up, the more I suffer for the one on the bus, right? So how are these trade-offs reconciled in this? Do we use different pricing structure to, to balance the two or not, right? Or just that the people just, there's a different degree of uh, deviation, so we just uh, uh, absorb that. The other one is, um, uh, I'm not sure in the design where is all the passenger on demand or there are still passengers who use the bus route as a regular bus. So I come to the bus stop at 8.20, wait for the bus, right? So how do you, uh, balance between the interests of the one who are waiting on the bus using the regular bus versus the on-demand part. So that two levels of potential trade-off uh, into the customer behavior side. Yeah, how do, does the model yeah, that... represent to such uh, uh, trade-offs? Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. yeah, so that's a great question. And um, so I, I'll answer the second one first. Um, the, the way we conceptualize, maybe I will go back to uh, one of my slides uh, to have a picture. Uh, let's read this, sorry. So the way we conceptualize this is that your line will have a bunch of checkpoints uh, at predetermined stops. Um, so following the red line in Kindle, you're gonna have a checkpoint at Central Square, Kindle Square, downtown and so on. And then the, the the way um, this uh, system right now works is that we have uh, deviations from checkpoint to checkpoint um, that will um, that will unfold 
but then the 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 uh the bus will be required to visit some of these checkpoints and then there is a result that i haven't showed here that is uh quite interesting is what is the extent of deviations that is needed in order to reap the benefits that I have presented? And the answer is not a lot. And to me, that's a very interesting result. And basically what I'm saying is that there are two ways to, to think about these deviations. One is, can I skip checkpoints or not, right? Um, and the other one is, how far can I travel from the bus line that was published in advance? Mm -hmm. And basically what, what we're saying is that when we move from transit to the smallest possible deviations, meaning you move by only a little and you visit all the checkpoints, you get 80% or something of the benefits of what you would get if you actually had way more flexibility. You could deviate from more and then you could go to, you could skip a checkpoint and this type of things. And from a practical standpoint, this has a huge implication exactly to your point, which is that if honestly I had to implement this thing, I would require you to visit all the checkpoints because some people are not as tech savvy, will not have the smartphone, will not have the app, will show up at the um, will show up at the uh, at the transit stop and will expect a bus to show up. Um, and and even if we constrain the system to operate that way, we're getting most of the benefits that I have presented. Um, mm -hmm. So that's my answer to your second question. My answer to your first question is that there is a huge question I haven't even touched on here. And I've seen in the chat that there were some, some questions on, along these lines as well, which is uh, what's the fare structure? What's the pricing structure? How to incentivize people to use this and how to reward them for waiting and walking and this type of thing. So there are, so here, um, this is a question that we had investigated in my previous uh, presentation to this forum that was um, dealing with uh, kind of vehicle uh, walking products in ride sharing when, when we had vehicle customer coordination. And, um, and here we had, uh, we had showed um, that there were multiple mechanisms that can be used to share the benefits or the savings between the firm and, um, uh, and the passengers. Uh, one would be to like basically provide a discount to everyone that is actually walking and a smaller discount to people who are, let's say, served at home. Um, the other one would be to lower the fare altogether in a uniform manner. Um, so the question is how to how to price these uh, these systems. The idea, and I think that um, what uh, what these the reason why I find some of these results exciting is that we're able to again, if we start from a transit standpoint we're able now to serve more people at a marginally higher cost by drastically reducing the distance per passenger, which means drastically reducing the cost per passenger. Um, all of these, um, and I've seen again, um, answer, uh, questions in the chat, but we're doing an apple to apple comparison, which means that these five systems here have the same overall capacity, right? For example, you would have 10 vehicles of 20 seats versus 200 vehicles of one seat versus Wait a minute, 50 vehicles of four seats. Math is hard. Um, but, um, but what this is saying here is that these benefits that I'm, that I'm seeing in terms of reduction of distance per passengers are really um, cost reduction. And these cost reductions create opportunities to provide either a transit system that has a broader, a larger capacity than today, or to create a transit system at a lower price point than today. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Alex. So, the last question from me, I then give to, to John, mm -hmm. which is, uh, uh, you mentioned this, uh, there's a whole spectrum here, right? From the classical transit, fixed route, fixed schedule to fully on demand, right? then you can relax on either dimension to various degrees, or you can relax on, on, on all dimensions, right? Along the spectrum, uh, we'll, think, we'll think about under what condition uh, this point along the dimension should, should sit, right? Uh, uh, for example, would, uh, would a population density or demand density be a crucial factor to determine uh, where do you, do, you, do you locate on this, uh, on this uh, spectrum? That's a, that's a very interesting question too. So um, demand density plays an incredibly large role in what I've presented. And I, I, I didn't show these results here. We have details in the paper. Um, <clears throat> but we basically partition all of the lines into three sections. Low density, medium density, high density. Um, low density is, let's say, Harlem. 
Medium density will be Upper West Side. High density will be Midtown, okay, roughly speaking. So what happens where? What happens where is that in low density areas, we are seeing a, um, a, a small increase in uh, demand coverage as compared to microtransit. Why? Because there are not that many people out there. So the, the, the pool is not that huge. Um, in contrast, in high density areas, we're seeing also a relatively small increase in coverage as compared to transit. Why? Because transit works. If you have a line that is like, like the, the best example I have is the Harvard Bridge around MIT between Boston and uh, Boston and MIT. It's a huge demand area. Everyone goes from Boston to MIT, from MIT to Boston. And why would you deviate? Well, it's a bridge, so it's difficult to deviate on a bridge. But um, the, the point is that when you have a high density corridor, transit works. And so the benefit of this flexibility is meager. Right In between, that's where you're seeing a lot of benefits. Because in between, you have relatively high density, therefore you have a pool of untapped demand, but at the same time, you have sufficient variability in your demand so that transit is not sufficient. And that is really where uh, the benefits are strongest. So the way, again, to simplify, simplify, and simplify again, low density, right pooling works, high density, transit works, medium density, there is really scope for significant benefits through this type of hybrid systems. Oh, that, that, that's great. I, I just have one remark and give it to John, which is uh, 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 this is based on New York City, right? Even a low yeah. density area in New York City probably is uh, well considered as very high density much of the United States. That's true. Uh, yeah. right, that's right, true. Yeah. Uh, but with that said, uh, John, please, for the audience question and answers. Yeah. Alex, thanks so much. As always, we had a, a many, many questions in the chat. Um, maybe just to start out, there were some clarifying questions about the results that you presented. So, I mean, one question was, this is based on a simulation model. I assume the answer to that is yes. Uh, what I wanted to just clarify is in the results slide, you showed transit, microtransit, different types of ride pooling. Those were meant to be sort of either or options. In other words, transit would represent the results of the modeling if you had a fleet of buses. Microtransit would, would represent a fleet of smaller sized vehicles, but with no buses. Is that is that correct? I just want real clarity yes. on what we're looking at in the results. Yes, yes, yes. Here, we're basically saying, hey, we have a pool of demand that comes from the New York taxi data. How can we serve them? Full transit, full microtransit, or full ride sharing. And in fact, in follow-on work um, that we're conducting, we're trying to understand, okay, so there is another way of combining transit and on-demand. Forget about microtransit. Is where do you place things on demand? When do you place things um, with uh, transit? So we're looking into these different models, which is a hybrid fleet yes. of different modes. And here we're looking at a uniform fleet of hybrid modes. So, yeah. Okay, so I think that's really the core is, you know, yeah. what is this great opportunity of a hybrid system that you just alluded mm -hmm. to. You know, it makes a lot of sense that in the high density corridors, public transportation, whether it's Metro or a dedicated bus line works very, very well. How can yeah. we build these types of feeder systems? And, you know, I, I really, that, that to me seems like the, the epic opportunity. And, and those feeder systems could be built by a company like VIA. You know, they could be a sort of a privately provided entity or they could be publicly provided. Um, so I just, I want you to take a step back and maybe this is also for Nigel and Jinwa and everything and say, you know, what's the main message that you want to convey to everybody here about that opportunity of these hybrid systems? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So here is, I mean, I'm gonna go back to my answer to Jinwa, which is that the, so the talk shows that there are benefits of flexibility in the systems. The talk shows that there is a scope for hybrid solutions that improve efficiency, equity, and, and sustainability. Um, yep. The results also show that these benefits are, are not uniform. 
Um, and so again, to go back to my simplified uh, version of the results um, from um, with uh, with Genoa is to say the following: is to say that the density really plays a key role. I mean, there are other things, but this is really the primary driver. The instances where you have uh, low density, I think that um, right uh, right pooling works relatively well, or right sharing works relatively well. In settings where you have high density. Transit works relatively well. And in between, this is really where you can design these hybrid systems. And the one question that is also in your question that is making all of that way more complicated is then you then you can actually design a system that leverages these principles that I just mentioned with multimodal operations. And so if now you start thinking about ride sharing as a feeder into transit, what does that look like? And it, you know what? What if, what if you start looking at like ride sharing as a feeder? For microtransit, what does that look like? So the the one way one way I think that we can simplify the conversation is what are areas where ride sharing works well by itself? What are areas where you need to have a feeding system between um, uh, ride sharing and transit? And then out of all of these transit solutions, what do you want to operate the simple old way as a transit system versus um, the more fancy way as a flexible system, and where do you get really most of these benefits for these uh, uh, for these more complex operations? Um, yeah, so uh, so we have a little bit of ongoing work on this, uh, and uh, and uh, happy to report results in the future for for these uh, for these hybrid um, uh, hybrid systems. And and is there any distinction that you've made between um, a transit system that is primarily metro or underground, maybe supplemented with buses, versus just purely a bus network? I mean, is yeah, you, here, here indeed we're looking at a bus network because it's. I mean, again, because of the physical restrictions about on-demand deviations for a metro system. So yes, that's a good clarification as well. We're looking at the bus systems here. Um, again, the New York taxi data are not here to say, hey, that can and should exist only in New York. Um, it's really like because we have information there. Um, and in fact, I was presenting um, I was presenting that uh, last week in uh, in Boulder and people got super excited because Boulder is like a, almost a case in point of these types of like medium density areas. Um, where you have ver basically no transit options to go from Boulder to the transit to the Denver airport, um, and so that's really one of the one of these areas. And there is no subway system, right? So, um, so could we uh, could we design this in these like again medium density areas yeah. that rely on road networks um, and would benefit from the systems? Okay. A uh, couple questions from from the from the group. So, uh, Catalina Vargas asked, "Have you looked at the impact of microtransit versus transit on just on city traffic? Does it create more congestion, especially in big cities where it would need to where we would need more microtransit vehicles to um, feed the demand? Any analysis of that in in your modeling impact on overall? Yeah, and th this is." This is a good question. That's a question that we had when we were looking at our results. And in fact, I think that this is uh, some of the one of the strongest points of um, of the system uh, in the sense that um, the again we are looking at a micro transit uh, system that has the same capacity as a transit system, uh, and that will induce way fewer vehicles on the road than single look up and see equivalent. Again, we're looking at taxi data, right? So lots of consolidation here uh, and therefore smaller um, contributions to congestion and emission. Um, we're not increasing the fleet size as compared to transit. Now, now there is another question that also goes back to Nigel's point about, about okay, will people be willing to do that? And, and that, there is a variant that is, oh, maybe no, no, people no, no, would be yeah will be um, adversely reacting to, to some of uh, the pooling aspect or the deviations aspect and whatnot. But then there may also be like, oh, wow, now I have a transit option that gives me a better level of service than I was used to. And maybe that would induce more demand and maybe there would be more vehicles on the road. But then these additional vehicles on the road, the hope is that that would actually replace demand that would otherwise be uh, served by single occupancy vehicles. 
So um, complex systems, we really think about this uh, more holistically. We need to think about um, discrete choice models of passenger travel behaviors, which is beyond the scope of that present paper. Um, but at least I think that these results can be interpreted as pointers in this, uh, um, in this conversation. Um, I see that uh, Dr. Shankar Viswanath yeah. has raised his hand. So I think you must have an urgent question. Please yeah. go ahead. I have, I have an urgent question. Thank you. I wanted to understand the word coverage. When you say coverage, does it mean the area covered by the microtransit or what exactly is that? That is the percentage of uh, people that we're serving. So uh, out of all of the taxi, again, we have a limited fleet out of all of the taxi demand data that we have in New York City, we are serving 36% of those that are going to the airport. And actually, the reason why I did the last part of the analysis is that indeed, we're not serving everybody, neither is ride sharing with limited capacity and everything. So what happens if everyone that we're not serving actually ends up going to the airport by themselves using a taxi or a single occupancy vehicle? Um, and and so that's where we started the, having this conversation between demand consolidation uh, versus uh, uh, demand coverage and the well, kind of a middle ground that is giving us a win-win over uh, ride sharing and transit. So if I understand it correct, in Mumbai, in India, almost all the people are dependent on the micro transit from the mass transit stations to their homes. So will you call it? Uh, almost 100% coverage, everyone is dependent. Yes, I, it's, yes, I don't, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know how to answer that question because, uh, I mean, I, I mean, I don't know what, because I mean, we need to no think one, about like what's, no the, what's one, the underlying pool of demand, where, whether there yes. is latent demand and, and these type of things, I don't know that, I'm sorry. Because nobody uses a car to the railway station, they use the car all the way, uh -huh. otherwise the mass transit users, are all dependent on the micro transit from the station. I yeah. Um, now, I mean, this is a good one. We can look into that uh, for sure. Uh, I, I I have a lot of uh, research experience in India on the logistics side, but not on this side. So uh, uh, yes. so that that would be that would be an interesting follow up. Thank, thank right. you for the for the question, Doctor. I, I just want to get one very quickly one more question in. I know we're at time. The, the question is about the impact on the transit bus route deviations on the reliability of passenger weight and in vehicle travel times. So this goes into thinking about um, the number of left turns at intersections uh, and so forth. Um, this is a kind of a detailed routing question, but Alex, any any idea on sort of the, or any reactions to that question, the impact of the transit bus route deviations on reliability of passenger weight and in-vehicle travel times? Yes, I think it's a great point. Uh, and I do think that this is, uh, this is something to think about. And I think that this is a limitation of this uh, operating model. Um, the... Um, Buses travel faster when the route is fixed. Buses travel faster on Mass Ave than on adjacent um, adjacent roads. Um, left turns are a concern. So 100%, this is actually a very good point. Um, this can be relatively easily addressed by including buffers in everything that we're doing, but buffers come with cost and reliability impl implications. So um, I think that this is a great point. Thank you for whoever raised it. And um, and I, uh, it warrants more research. I agree with that. Great, yeah. Th thanks, Alex, again. Sorry to, to interrupt the conversation. There's so many more questions that we could continue the conversation there, yeah. Yes. Uh, go ahead, Atai. I'm in the process uh, of saving the chat. So I really appreciate everybody um, everybody's uh, inputs and uh, I'll, I'll read all of this offline. Right, yeah. Uh, last to say that Alex, we should invite you come to Building Nine more often. There's uh, thirty uh, uh, very <laughs> enthusiastic transit nuts at uh, MIT Transit Lab waiting for you to talk more with us. So everybody, please join me. Thank Professor Jeff Lad for the conversation. Thanks, everyone.